Well, it is time for Romans chapter 4. I'm Jeremy, and I'm joined by my friend Jeff. Well, God said to Abraham, kill me a son. Abe said, man, you must be putting me on. God said, what? Abe said, what? God said, oh gosh, wait, I got, oh my gosh, I've been practicing this so much. (laughs) (laughs) You had your chance, and you just just totally botched it. Abe said, no, God said, what god said you can do what you want Abe, but the next time you see me coming you'd better run abe said where you want all this killing done out on highway 61 nice yeah do you feel better now (laughs) i feel i feel awful i had one one job to do and i blew it (laughs) i threw away my shot you know it's a little reminiscent of uh, our last episode of hebrews where you busted out the pink ukulele and your custom song Mm -hmm. but that Mm -hmm. performance was flawless you yeah you had you had prepared for that so you're slipping a little bit i'm (laughs) i'm slipping in my old age you know just just like dylan himself you know i I don't have the magic of the youth anymore on my side are you a dylan fan oh yeah of course are are you I, I would not put myself in that category, no. Many, many episodes ago, I was going to ask you, when I did ask you the question, is the Bible really that deep? And I was thinking of, like, what could I compare it to? Like, what's another thing I could say is pretty deep? So I was going to say, like, I mean, couldn't you say, like, Bob Dylan lyrics are as deep or deeper than the Bible? Um, but then I thought, actually, like, a lot of Bob Dylan's lyrics, like, draw from the Bible, and he uses the Bible as as kind of a starting off point for a lot of his ideas and themes. So... I guess you had to give give it to the Bible there for it's, it's almost circular logic. Where, where would Bob Dylan be without the Bible? You know, right, right, yeah, yeah. Where would any of us be without the Bible, Jeff? We wouldn't have a podcast. That's we for would sure. not. We would not be doing what we're doing now, getting to entertain our listeners with our rants and raves and perspectives and and all of that. So we're we're grateful for the Bible and all of its weirdness and messiness and. And beauty, dare I say. Yeah, totally. Well, we're in to that beautiful Bible, chapter four of the book of Romans. And today we are looking at whether faith in God is supposed to be easy. If you can be a good person without faith, we are wrestling with the merits of Abraham being willing to kill his son and how Christians should view Islam. A few little indicators of where we're where we're going here. But before we get there, I'd like to to cast some vision, set the stage, if you will. Verse 15, Paul says, "For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it." Which is why we don't try to follow the law today. We follow Jesus. And that, my friends, is good news. Yeah, that the second part is good news. Yeah, the first part seems seems kind of cruel and manipulative to be. If God gives us the law, makes us follow the law, and then punishes us for not being able to follow the law, like you kind of set us up for failure there, right? I see. I see where you're going with that. <laughs> but if Jesus fulfills the law, yeah, and then yeah. Jesus invites us to follow Him. Now we've got good news. Yeah, I I can see how that part is good news. So (laughs) I'll give you that. Okay. All right. We'll we'll agree on that part. Uh All right, Jeff, what questions do you got? Romans chapter four. Yeah. So this whole chapter is uh, talking about Abraham, the faith of Abraham. Very, very important Old Testament figure featured prominently in in a Bob Dylan song. He he shows up in a few verses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's, He's a big deal. Anyway, um, and he had many sons, and, and I'm one of them. So are you. Wow, that's a, Sunday school's coming back to me now. <laughs> did you did you know the motions for that song? Yeah, right arm, left arm. Oh yeah, the, yeah. the marching, all the whole thing. Yeah, I was I was considering using that song instead. There's you know two two really famous mm. songs that are all about Abraham. We should have included a Sunday school trigger warning on this episode <laughs> of like, if you have painful, repressed Sunday school memories, we're bringing them all back up. Or or big church trigger warning. Later, we're going to talk about a, a story that I hear talked about a lot in, in 
big kid church. So <laughs> is there an accompanying song with it? Highway 61 revisited. I, I brought it up at the beginning of the episode. I, I don't, I've never <laughs> sung that in church. Come on. <laughs> Dylan, Dylan yeah. doesn't go to church. Yeah. Well, he did. He did for a while in the seventies, yeah. but all right. So, uh, Romans 4, I want to start in verse 4, when it says, When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God, who forgives sinners. So just kind of a, a side note here to say that it, it, this verse also makes me think of the question we've talked about before of like, can you even choose whether you believe or not? Can you choose whether to have faith or not? Just wanted to put that out there, but kind of put it to the side because I want to talk about this New Testament concept of faith is more important than works. It's a huge theme in, in Romans and throughout the, the New Testament, I would say. And this was kind of a new thought that occurred to me as I was processing Romans 4 that I, I think I hadn't thought of much before. But as I think about it now, I feel like in some ways having faith is a lot of work. When I think about like, what would it take for me to be a Christian again? I feel like I would either need to, you know, hypothetically like form a podcast and get all my questions answered <laughs> or hypothetically, of course. Yeah. Or do the hard work of kind of just suppressing all of my questions and putting them to the side and just not worrying about them anymore. That that sounds easier said than done <laughs> to me anyway. Uh, and of course there's you know the whole field of apologetics and it, it makes me think of books like how to stay Christian in college or ministries like answers in Genesis, where they do the hard work of taking all of the claims in the book of Genesis and making it make sense from a scientific perspective. But this whole idea of salvation is supposed to be a free gift as Paul calls it. Jesus says, my burden is light in Matthew 11. So it makes me ask the question, Jeremy, is faith supposed to be easy and effortless or is it supposed to be a lot of work? Well, let's think about just normal relationships, human relationships, you know, if you will, to, to try to break this down to a more manageable bite-sized uh, chunk. I don't know of any healthy relationships that are effortless. So if I think about like a healthy friendship, certainly uh, marriage, um, even parenting kids, I don't know any of those relationships that you would look at and go, wow, that one, look, look at that marriage or look at that friendship or look at that father, son, mother, daughter, what, you know, whatever. And, and go, wow, that is a really good, healthy relationship. I don't know any of those that you could unpack and then say, they just arrived there. You know, that just, that just how it's, that's how that is. Now, I think there are some that are easier than others for sure, but I think at a minimum, healthy relationships take work. And ironically, I think the closer you are in a relationship in any one of those contexts, when you do have a fight, when you do have a disagreement, they feel bigger, the closer the, the relationship is, right? So mm -hmm. like, I can have a fight with my wife, and it will be a very big deal to me. Whereas I might have, you know, a fight with a coworker or something. And I'm like, yeah, you know, big deal. Like, we, right. we that I, but the more that relationship matters to me, uh, the more invested I am in it, the closer we are, the bigger that is. And you might think, well, it should be the other way around. And yet, you know, anyone, anyone who thinks about any relationship they have would go, yeah, that's, that is the way it works. You know, the, the, the ones that mean the most to you are often the hardest. So I don't think faith by itself is supposed to be effortless. And I don't, I don't think that it's even supported in the text holistically across the board. I think where we get confused is that we tend to equate faith with salvation. And so we think, all right, salvation is either easy or hard. And then we apply the same type of thing to whether or not I'm saved. So if I do all these things, right, then God will save me. So I, I, I've done the right part. I've done the work. But I, I think that's where we get it messed up. From a salvation point of view, I would say start with the conclusion that you are saved and you are loved and you are made in the image of God and then act accordingly, right? So start with that in mind, then try to have a faith that lives up to that, that, that responds accordingly. But I think faith is, is definitely something that takes work. 
And there's so many examples. And I actually love these. Um, I've for years wanted to like write a book on just this topic of how many times Jesus points out someone's faith. Like he's about to do something, but he'll say, wow, you know, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel or your mm-hmm. faith has saved you or your faith has made you well. Right. Well, if, if there's nothing to that, if that's just, you know, some people would say, well, faith is just a gift of God. You can't no. Well then what is Jesus saying in all these examples? He's, he's complimenting this person going, you have chosen something. Right. So I think faith absolutely requires something of you. Where we get confused on that is if we equate, well, that's what I have to do then to be saved. Does that make sense? Well, so when you brought up Jesus, it made me think of, you know, so Jesus says, all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed to move mountains. And so I feel like that's supposed to be an encouragement, right? Because he's saying a mustard seed is so small, you only need a little bit of faith. But I feel like uh, oftentimes or more recently, I've thought of that more as a discouraging thing of like, wow, my faith must be even smaller than a mustard seed. I must have like <laughs> half a mustard seed worth of faith or or less because, you know, I, I ain't moving no mountains. Yeah. It, yeah. That's an interesting, even that passage, you know, like who of us have moved any mountain with our faith, right? So mm-hmm. literally, you know, he's using hyperbolic language on both ends, something massive, something very small, you know. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, I've never moved him out with my faith either. So evidently I'm with you on whatever tinier seed of faith we have than, than a mustard seed. Yeah. I do think the point of that was to be, was to be encouraging whether, whether it serves whether that purpose for you. or not. Right. Yeah. Is, is a different thing. You know, if you think you have to have a certain type of faith in order to be saved, then yeah, that is a daunting, you know, I, I don't, I don't have enough faith. But I would say more than that, you know, because again, we've talked about this elsewhere. I I think, I think God is good enough that Jesus is going to save everybody. It's my personal Mm -hmm. take. Plenty of Christians would disagree with that. But that's, that's my personal take. So then I almost rule out that whole part of it. So then faith is not that because we're all going to experience that at some point. Then faith is how much do I experience God right now in my life? Because I'm looking for it, I'm open to it, I'm inviting it. That to me is more of, you know, what am I going to experience in the day to day? That's where faith comes in. And I do think that takes work. And we're going to get into it a little bit more with another verse in this chapter. But um, I think that's something that Paul is getting at too and developing a theme of, hey, you're going to have to choose this. And there may be times when you you think I shouldn't choose this or I should choose anything else other than this. And yet you make the choice that this is what I'm going to land on. Because he's trying to say that it's good news in the sense of you don't need to follow the law anymore, right? So it's yeah. like, what, like, I don't know, would you say like faith is less work than the, I don't know, the physical work of oh, fulfilling the law because it's just a, a mental exercise? Well, I but, think it's mental, yeah. but it's also... You know, we, we talked about this, I think it was last week, uh, the idea that ideas have consequences, right? So if I put mm-hmm. my faith in Jesus, that'll shape decisions that I make in my life, right? So I'm going to choose this over that. Why? Because I'm putting faith in, you know, Jesus. So it's not just a a mental exercise of I'm able to wrap my head around, some, you know, that no one else can. It's like, no, that that might be an element or component of it, but faith is what ultimately leads to the actions that you make. And I I would say, absolutely. Paul is contrasting that with living under the law and saying, Mm -hmm. this was really, really hard. And then the point we just, you know, I I started the podcast off with of, yeah. And you're doomed to failure if you try that, you know? And so here's something you're not going to fail at. You can actually have faith and, you know, going back to the mustard seed, even if you can get a little bit, Jesus seems to think, Hey, that's going to, that's going to provide something for you in your life. And so, you know, there can be people with massive amounts of faith or a little bit of faith. And all of it is an invitation for God, you know, to be engaged in your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of going back and forth in my mind, just even as we speak of like, is it harder to just like follow instructions? Like I get the Old Testament laws. There's, there's a lot of laws and it's it's impossible to follow it perfectly. But again, like with the choosing thing, at least you can just, will yourself you can just like make yourself not lie not steal not murder not covet blah 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 but you can't necessarily make make yourself believe something you don't believe 
I don't sure. know. Does that make I, sense? Absolutely. And I don't yeah. think that's what faith is. I don't think mm -hmm. faith is, you know, suppressing your natural doubts and overcoming your logic and reason. And mm -hmm. sadly, a lot of Christians do kind of present faith like that sometimes where, you know, you just need to believe. And, you know, it's funny to me, I, I get this a lot <laughs> on my social, we talk about, you know, social media pushback I get every week. I, you know, I post clips of, of what we talk about and yeah, yeah. Then I, I, I get the Theo bros into the chat. Theo bros and Theo sisses. Uh, <clears> the, <throat> the, the ladies are there as well. You know, don't like my take on this or that. And it's amazing to me, especially this last week. I don't know what it was about this last week's episode. Uh, <laughs> chapter three really riled him up. But how many times people quoted to me basically this idea of God's ways are better than my ways. We just won't understand. And so almost mm -hmm. like I was getting faulted for trying to use too much logic to explain some of these things where I should have just said, well, God's mysterious and we can't understand this. And to me, that's, that's just not faith. Like faith isn't, because we've talked about this, faith isn't the ability to believe something that's not believable. That just is a sign of a low intellect. Faith is mm -hmm. saying, hey, I can't prove this, but I have enough to go on of why I believe this. And so where there's a gap of what I can prove, I'm going to trust God with that gap, right? So it's not saying, you know, if I had no evidence of God, I would not put my faith in Jesus. Like if there was nothing that logically lined up for me, I, I promise you, mm -hmm. we, we might flip roles on this podcast, right? I'd be the one going, this is, this is a bunch of BS, you know? But sure. the reason I have faith where there's gaps is because everything that I can logically wrap my mind around makes sense to me and points me to Jesus. And that to me is the essence where I think we, we get that confused a lot. So yeah, if, if faith was the ability to convince yourself something is true that you don't believe is true, that would be harder than the Old mm -hmm. Testament commands. But I don't think that's what faith is at all, thankfully. We'll have to talk about this later down the road when we get to the the sinner's prayer verse. But I, don't, I was just trying to think of like, how did I see faith and salvation and everything when it was first introduced to me as a kid, which was basically just, just pray this prayer and you're all good. And it's like, you know, basically the equivalent of when you're a college freshman and someone's just, just sign here, like, don't even read it. Just, you know, or <laughs> sign like up. The, it's it's going to be fun that you get now and you're like this is 40 pages i'm not reading all this like yes i accept yeah because yeah in that sense it's like if all you have to do is pray a prayer no questions asked then then yeah salvation is is incredibly easy <laughs> but also also but they, incredibly high stakes because uh, that means anyone who hasn't been exposed to <laughs> the the gospel in in sunday school is in danger of hellfire right but maybe another way of looking at it is when when you can when you get to the end of your logic and again, I think some people get to the end of their logic faster than others. When you get to the end where you go, all right, at this point, I'm going to have to put faith in something because I can't prove it beyond this point. Mm -hmm. What do you put? What do you put your faith in? That That's really what I think we're talking about. It's not, hey, I'm dismissing everything else before that. It's like, no, when I get to that point and regardless of what you believe, and we've talked about this, even in you sharing some of your views on how do we get here, right? There. In all of this, there, there's an acknowledgement at some point. All right, this is as far as I can logically get to. And then I don't know. And, you know, and it's like at that point, you're putting faith into something when you go, I cannot explain beyond this point. And, and so to me, Christian faith is saying when I get to that point with with Jesus, I, I then give, you know, God the benefit of the doubt and go, all right, I choose from everything else I've seen. I choose to put the rest of the faith in you. This verse that you brought up, I, I actually was thinking about this verse for you. And so I want to ask verse five, reread it, and then ask you. Uh, it says, people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, okay, which is the law, but because of their faith. So Paul says, you can't be righteous anymore because of what you do, but only by faith. So I'm curious, how does this strike you? As someone who no longer puts their faith in God, but from everything I know of you, you still want to be a good person. Can you can you do this with Paul's argument here, or how do you react to what Paul's saying that you you can only you know be righteous by faith? I guess I would say this is a place where I definitely disagree with Paul because I'm just thinking about like who would you have more respect for 
a Christian who does terrible things or an atheist who does good things. You know, like it's it seems pretty clear to me from you know, from a secular point of view in this life, faith is not the most important thing. Like what you do is more important than what you believe. And like in some ways it could like what you believe can be worse because if you say you believe something and then you do the opposite, then you're a hypocrite, right? Uh, it made me think of the the passage in James where it said faith without good works is dead. And it's it's interesting to think uh, to realize when I was reading James 2, the full chapter in context, it's talking about the story of of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. And James seems to be kind of in disagreement with Paul there because James is saying like it was not because of Abraham's faith. It was because of his his work, his willingness to go through with the sacrifice that that's why he was saved or that like his works confirmed his faith basically. Mm. And and then Jesus also oftentimes talks about like works, what you do being more important than what you believe. He ends the Sermon on the Mount by saying, anyone who hears my teachings and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. And just one more quote from Batman. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. So I think that, yeah, works are more important than faith. So two Bible verses in Batman. Is yeah, that- yeah, the... The, you the know trend. what's interesting as I'm listening to that answer, you know what you just did hmm. is you you put Paul under Jesus and you interpreted Paul through Jesus and said actually Jesus said it is important. Yeah. I just I just want to point that out. That was that was a beautiful moment for me right there. You do that. <laughs> yeah. The uh the teacher has become the master. <laughs> or the student, rather. <laughs> oh, that's great. I I really like what you just said. And I would agree that I would rather have an atheist who does good things than a Christian who's a total douchebag. James obviously speaks to that, like you said, but I, the Sermon on the Mount is beautiful. You know, that's that's obviously the, the pinnacle for a Christian of like, this is what it actually looks like. But I even think, you know, talking about a lot like Galatians 5, you know, the fruit of the spirit. Those mm-hmm. aren't Those aren't abstract concepts. Those are very tangible, practical things that you can either see or not see you know, in someone's life. And so I think even to make the argument, I, as a Christian have a lot of faith, but it doesn't produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You know what I mean? Like if none of those things are evident in my life, but my faith is incredible. It's like, well, what the heck is your faith in? Because if, if it's in God and the Holy spirit is indwelling inside of you, these are the things that we've been told to look for. Like these are the things that it will produce. And if it's not, something's off so actually man kudos to you i like that answer that's good oh thanks yeah but it's it's interesting because i feel like it's like the whole faith versus works question maybe you can acknowledge the nuance but you always have to land on a certain side and say like yeah it's about faith over works like if anytime like a pastor leans too hard into talking about your good works will save you people always call them out on it and say like no you're teaching a works-based salvation and like, yeah, I, I just, I would argue that the New Testament, you know, like a lot of things in the Bible, like the Bible are used for both sides and is kind of in disagreement with itself there. Well, but to reiterate my earlier point, mm-hmm. I would remove the whole salvation element from it completely because okay. I, I think yeah. God's going to save everybody. So mm-hmm. remove that from the conversation and then say, what does real faith look like? Like it should produce action. It should produce something in your life. Not because that's what's going to save you. You're already saved. Like, I think Mm -hmm. Jesus is going to save everybody. But because God wants us to be more like God. That's what we were created, to be image bearers. And God looks like Jesus, looks like the fruit of the Spirit. Like, these are things. So any real healthy faith should ultimately produce some journey toward that direction. And Mm -hmm. it is sad. It's a sad irony if an atheist is modeling that better than someone who claims to have faith in the God who embodies those things. Christians without without producing good fruit, you, you're called out. Consider yeah. yourselves warned. There we go. Okay, well, so let's let's move on to uh, a story of of definitely faith, definitely faith, but with questionable fruit. At least I would say. On a lighter note. <laughs> on a lighter note, yeah. Let's let's go back to Sunday school. So, verse thirteen. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. So, okay, the 
story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac is what I want to bring up here. It's not explicitly brought up in uh, Romans chapter four here, but it's, I'd say it's kind of like the ultimate story of Abraham, like his faith being tested, proving his faith. And it also has a lot to do with his descendants. So I wanted to, to bring that up because it's, you know, it's a very commonly cited story. It's an example of faith. It's another one of those stories that I feel like Christians love and embrace this story because it does have a happy ending. You know, at the end of the story, he doesn't have to sacrifice Isaac. Like God swoops in and stops him at the last minute. But I still feel like it's another one of those stories from the Old Testament where God is not really the good guy here. And the only way you can see him as the good guy is if you go in with the preconceived notion that God has to be good. I'd say if you read the story straight, it's like, yeah, it's it's good that he doesn't have to go through with it in the end. But it's still not great in my from my perception that God wants Abraham to prove himself, prove his loyalty. It seems a little bit cruel and manipulative to me. It also sets sets a bad precedent because there have been other stories of people who feel like they've heard from God and feel like God is testing their faith and they actually literally have gone through with it and sacrificed their own children to prove their faith in God. I've heard a lot of people praise Abraham for his faith in this story and talk about how you know God is always good no matter what this, the Bible says about him. So my question for you, Jeremy, how do you view this story as a father? Well, I grew up reading this story. I grew up in Sunday school. And so as long as I can remember, this mm-hmm. was told to me as, as a beautiful story. You know, everything you just kind of mocked was my childhood, right? Yeah. Uh, so I remember the flannel graphs. I remember all the cartoon Abrahams. I remember all the, you know, cartoon Isaacs and the lamb and all this. And, you know, that was, that was certainly the way it was presented to me for years and years and years and years. And then I, I vividly remember having a moment reading this as a dad. So once I had had kids of my own and rereading this, just kind of rereading the story one day. And I had this moment where I realized if I was Abraham, I wouldn't do it. And I remember reading it and, and just having this honest reaction of this is horrific. Like this is horrific of what God is asking. And to be honest with you, I had a, I had a moment of like a little bit of faith crisis because, you know, I'm like, well, who am I? Right. To say no to God. If God were to ask me to do that, who, who am I to say no? And clearly then I don't have the kind of faith that Abraham had. And, and so I, I mean, I just like, this is a vivid personal memory because I remember it messed me up a bit when as a dad, I came back to this story and just realized I wouldn't like if, if I had, you know, some audible voice from God of like, go and kill your son. Mm hmm no, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do that, you know? And, you know, we talked about this last week of like, I'd rather, I would rather get the wrath of that kind of a God than do what that kind of God is asking me to do. You know what I mean? Like smite me if you're going to smite me or do whatever you're going to do to me. But like, I'm not going to go and kill one of my children for you. And, you know, really feeling the conundrum over that of like, well, on what basis then? Do, do I stand up to a God, you know, or, or, uh, you know, and I, so I, that like many other crises of faith in my life, you know, caused me to go do a deep dive. Like, okay, I gotta, I gotta wrestle through this. I gotta explore more of this. And basically I've reconciled that where now uh, I don't feel bad anymore that I wouldn't do this. And I don't feel bad because I know what God is like. And I know that this is not the heart of God and God would not desire it is totally inc- incongruous for God to ask me to sacrifice one of my children because I know that God looks like Jesus. And this is you know antithetical to that. We go, well, how do you explain the story? Well, that's where I think uh, a, a little bit of Bible study does wonders on, on some of these things. And, you know, this is where I've appreciated, you know, getting to go to seminary, getting to dive deep into these uh, reading books that are often very tedious, but you get to see perspectives that you you know, may not get otherwise. And what you realize if you study this story from an ancient Near East point of view, which is this is the culture, you know, that we find in the Old Testament. There were other ancient Near East cultures around them. They 
you know, they mix and match some things of the nations around them. They rejected some, they incorporated others, you know. Uh, what you find is that this idea of child sacrifice was a common ancient Near East worship practice. Like you, you can find this all over the place in other religions. And so what I would say now, understanding this, having read other cultures, having read other religions of that time, that I think I think God was doing this. And, and again, this goes back to progressive revelation that I talk about over and over and over again. But mm-hmm. God met them where they are, which is, hey, I want to I want to have you sacrifice your son. Here's my take. I think Abraham would have been like, yeah, of course you do. Mm-hmm. Like, obviously you do, because like this is what we all do in this culture. So we read that today. We're like, I don't know if I can do it. I don't think Abraham had that. That reaction. And now you might go, well, any doubt have that reaction. I would just push on that and say, I don't think we realize how cultural some of this stuff is. In that culture, I think this would have been an expectation that, you know, Abraham probably knew people who had sacrificed their children to their gods. It's like, like, so imagine this is something you've seen, you you grew up, you know. And, and so I think Abraham's like, oh, okay, yeah, of course I'll do that. And then what this is, is a plot twist. God's going, hey, I'm I'm making you think I'm like every other God, but then I'm going to flip the script on you and show you that I'm actually not at all like those other gods. So the fact that God provided the sacrifice rather than Abraham sacrificing his child is the plot twist. Now, even with that, there is some argument, and I think there's merit to this, that Abraham was more concerned about the logistics of this, right? Like, okay, God, you've made this promise to me. If I do what you're saying, I'm not going to be the father of all these nations, like logistically, this won't, this won't work. Right. So not as much of like an emotional, this is my son. No, he's going, if I do this, God, it will, you know, nullify this promise you've made to me that, you know, but there's a lot of scholars that that think that Abraham did it with the belief that God would raise Isaac back to life. So it was Hmm. almost this, like Abraham thought, yeah, I'm going to have to kill him, but believed God was going to raise him back to life. And I would even put Paul in this camp that I, I, I think Paul had this interpretation of the story because in chapter four, verse 17. So as he's telling the story of Abraham, notice what Paul says in verse 17. Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Hmm. So as yeah. he's talking about it. This, he's like, this is the kind of God Abraham believed in, the God that brings the dead back to life. Well, why would why would Paul say that? What is he talking about, right? He's talking about, I think, what Abraham anticipated God doing with Isaac. And so again, I think he's going, yeah, I had to sacrifice my son. Totally get it. That's what we do in, in this day and age, right? But he's thinking, I bet you God's going to bring Isaac back to life because he made me this promise. And so he has a hope. And, and that's where the faith was. Now, again, we can look at all this today and go, that is monstrous. That is absurd. And I just think it's easy when you live in a totally different culture to look back on, you know, ancient cultures and go, what, what on earth were they thinking? Well, look throughout history. Child sacrifice has been a thing throughout history in all sorts of religions. So we can fault them for this. You know, obviously it's horrific. But this was normal to them. This was something that they did. And so I think Abraham is operating within that framework, but expecting something to come of it. Now, today, here's the difference. Today, it would be utterly illogical now that we have seen God to be revealed in Jesus for God to ask someone in today's culture to do the same thing as Abraham, which is where I think some Christians who make the same argument are like, yeah, if God said that to you today, I hope you'd be willing to do it. I mean, BS, no, like horrible interpretation of this. God would not ask you to do it today because number one, you don't live in that culture. And number two, we have seen God to be revealed and to be the opposite of this. Abraham had not seen that yet. This was part of God revealing, hey, you may think I'm like all these other gods, but I'm actually not like these other gods. And here's a twist on that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that point. Thank you for saying that. I don't know if I've heard another pastor <laughs> say it you know, basically say like, it's okay to say I wouldn't do it. You know, I feel like normally when this passage is preached, they say like, that's, that's a test. I don't know if I could do it. That'd be tough. But you know, God is more important than family. 
I guess I would I would push back a little bit though on like this this does seem consistent with both Jesus and Paul's message of saying like the the ministry is more important than family. Like leave your family, forget your family, and follow me is basically what, what Jesus says over and over again to people. And and then Paul saying, like, it's better not to be married so that you can, I wish everyone was like me and be single so you could just focus on the ministry. And it also reminds me of your your blog post you just did where you talked about um, Tozer, right? How, like, mm-hmm. Tozer, uh, Tozer's wife said she had some quote about how he loved Jesus more than he loved his wife. And you were calling him out on, on that kind of behavior as well. So that's that's fascinating. Well, yeah. And I would just say there's a difference between, you know, loving your family less than you love God and being willing to kill your child. <laughs> uh-huh. so I, would, I would just caution us a little bit putting that. Well, see, Jesus said the same thing. I would say, no, it's not the same thing. Uh, yeah, I just didn't, didn't say to kill anyone. Right. I understand good. the point you're making, but I would just say mm-hmm. that's not, I don't think Jesus makes this argument. And I don't think Paul makes this argument either and not wanting to be married. The point I was making in the blog post about Tozer was, you know, if you read Matthew 25, Jesus puts himself relationally into any situation in which the the least of these, the most marginal, vulnerable person we would interact with, Jesus says, whatever you do to that person, you do to me. Which then I would say, this would obviously include your children, your spouse, right? All the, Jesus is saying, and I am the person and anyone in need around you, like what you do to them, you do to me. So I would actually say, like, again, if we follow Jesus's ethic, we would never be able to treat someone like this because I could never do that to Jesus. Like, I'm, you know, if I see Jesus in my son and then I have this sense, well, God asked me to kill my son. Like, no, I'm not going to kill Jesus. Like Jesus is in my son, you know, so there's no way I could follow that because of my faith in Jesus, because I know that it would be, you know, contrary. And again, here's where this gets sad to me. And this is, there's been examples of this, but like people who have mental illness and hear mm-hmm. voices and they perceive that that is, you know, the voice of God and like, well, God told me to go and kill someone. And they use the story of Abraham as justification. And sadly, the way most Christians understand this passage, there really isn't a way to refute that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The traditional way of, well, yeah, they just had really good faith and they, unfortunately they were just hearing voices and it wasn't, it's like, well, how do we know Abraham wasn't hearing voices then? Like, there's no, you know, you have to have some other criteria as to why you would or would not do this. And to me, I would adamantly not do that because I have seen Jesus. I have seen the person of Jesus who God looks like. And I would say that is absolutely contrary to who Jesus is. That's kind of a big, another topic in general, but I feel like that's kind of just a problematic implication with the way that God speaks through the prophets in the Bible. You know what I mean? Like, because like I've asked the question before, like, why doesn't God just communicate more clearly? Why does he speak through specific people? Because it's like, especially when you get to the, like the the major prophets in the Old Testament, it's always this pattern of God gives his true message to one guy who's like wailing in the streets and no one's listening to him. And I just feel like you're, you're setting yourself up for failure, right? Because anyone could say, I have a message from God and no one will listen to me. You know, we have this today. We literally have people like on the sidewalk proclaiming what God is is speaking through them and, and no one listens to them. But maybe those people are the real prophets of today. You know, who's who's to say? Who's to say is you ultimately look for the fruit in their life and whether what they're saying, you know, makes any sense. And you have this mm-hmm. all throughout the scriptures, you know, and there's times where the, the actual prophets of God, you know, smack talk the fake prophets and like, all right, if that comes to pass, everything I've said is false. And, mm-hmm. you know, this guy's true. But if it doesn't come to pass, this guy's a phony, you know, and it's like it's biblical smack talk. And, you know, God would eventually say, like, you know, this one is, you know, proven true. But this is where faith comes in. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. you have the same things today, which is where we need to rely on the Holy Spirit inside of us to say, all right, how do I discern the, the street corner person yelling at me in a megaphone, whether or not that is true? Or, mm-hmm. or the preacher on stage on a weekend. Like, how do I discern whether what he's saying is true? Or, you know, or anything in between, you know? Like, yeah. there's got to be something else other than I just blindly listen to a person telling me. No, you, you have to, like, literally use your brain, which is why we do this podcast. It's not that you would listen to, well, Jeremy's answer is this. So that's the right answer. Or Jeff's answer. No, it's teaching you to think. <laughs> teaching you to, mm-hmm. like apply faith, apply reason, apply your doubt and go, how do I wrestle through this? 
so that when you're sitting in church or when you you know meet that Christian on the street corner or when someone hands you a pamphlet or something, you have some criteria to logically reason through is there merit in what they're saying or not. Do you think the podcasters are the prophets of today, Jeremy? Wow, that's a that's a broad, broad brush to, to be painting with. I think the local church is still incredibly powerful and offers a lot. So I'm not I'm not writing the church off. I mm-hmm. think that one of the limitations of the local church is that it's a monologue. It's it's not designed, especially in its current cultural form in America, it's not designed to engage much, you know, dialogue, debate, discussion. And so I think one of the challenges is if you attend a weekend service and you don't agree with the person on stage, a lot of people feel stuck. Like, well, what do I do? Like, do I have mm-hmm. to leave churches? You know, and the problem with that is you attend any church long enough, the pastor's going to say something you don't like or something you don't agree with. And then it's like, all right, go to the church down the street until they say something you don't like. And then you, you know, you're just perpetually church hopping. And so I think that's one of the inherent limitations of that model. Well, what podcasting is allowing and, you know, what we try to do with like some of our community and Wineco events is create much more of a dialogue, create much more of a, it's not a one person talking head at you. But you're going to hear nuance. You're going to hear discussion. You're going to hear, you know, room to 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 get into that. And so, even this, you know, we we've only added one more voice to what a normal church service would be. But the fact that we have two voices from two points of view is is allowing people to go. Oh, I find myself somewhere in this conversation, and then this can go into you know a group format or group discussion and. It's so one of the things, even with like uh, our upcoming community events, we have we have two coming up next week. I'm going to really focus on, you know, more like really leaning into the dialogue with people and getting them to be way more engaged, because that to me is where we've got to keep we've got to keep finding ways to do that, where it's not just hey, Christianity is 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 listening to the right person talk all the time, but Christianity is learning how to engage yourself in the conversation, think for yourself, and be an active part of you know, whatever it is that, that you believe. I appreciate you giving such a thorough and thoughtful answer to, some, to kind of a joke question. There. <laughs> that was great. Well, I'm, I'm always, I don't, I don't, I'm always a sucker for your jokes, Jeff, you know, I just I gotta <laughs> go for them. But I think, there's, I think there's a reason why podcasts are taken off is, you know, we, and you and I talk about this off the air mm-hmm. a lot, but like, we don't have any time constraints here. <laughs> So Mm -hmm. we could have an episode go 45 minutes. We can have an episode go two hours if we wanted. I don't know how many people would stick around with us that long. Maybe, maybe they would, but that's the beauty of this. Again, this unique model. Now, again, it has its own limitations as well, but like you're in a weekend service and you know, I, I was a lead pastor. I, I understand this. You have children's ministry, you have parking, you have, you know, lots of logistics, uh, and so it's like that all limits what you're able to do. And any model has its pros and cons. I think the podcasting model is obviously meeting a need for a lot of people. And you can listen to this, watch it, however you're digesting this material, you know, mm-hmm. whenever you want. And so you can be on a run, you can be on your driving to your commute, you can be watching YouTube clips. Like that's, I just think, uh, it's a cool way to engage in a conversation. It is cool. And yeah, we, we appreciate all of our listeners and everyone who's who's chiming in and adding to the conversation that's great i do love i love the texts i get each week and the emails and it's cool all right so i got a question for you we just we're talking about abraham so this is gonna be a good transition for us before we get into your your uh left field question that we're gonna land on romans 4 verse 18 says something that i think is is beautiful it says even when there was no reason for hope Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. So the idea of there, you could say there was no reason for hope, but Abraham kept hoping. And and I, I think about this too, and this is something I've said, and I, I think about this line a lot. Like, there isn't always a reason to be optimistic in life. Like, there's plenty of things I look at and go, that's discouraging. <laughs> like, there's not a reason to be optimistic on X, Y, and Z. But if you're a Christian... I would suggest there is always reason to be hopeful, not because you're hopeful for humanity or you're hopeful that we're going to get our act together, but you're hopeful for what ultimately Jesus can do. And so if you believe in Jesus, I don't think you should ever be without hope. And I I, I think Paul's kind of channeling this out of the Abraham story into like what it means for us today. 
Uh, Christine Kane has said it like this. Uh, Sometimes it takes hoping against hope to see the promises of God realized in our lives. Hope is not shallow, it's faith. So she's making the argument that this is actually an element of what faith is, is sometimes hoping against what you might see. So Jeff, I'm curious from your vantage point, do you see the idea of hoping when there is no reason for hope as a naive thing that Christians do? Or do you think there's something to this even from your point of view? That's great. I agree with the sentiment. I think, yes, it's naive, but it is also beautiful and it is necessary for survival in this world. It makes me think of in Return of the King when one of the hobbits asks Gandalf, is there any hope for Sam and Frodo to make it on this mission? And Gandalf says, just a fool's hope. There's all kinds of stories of survival and people overcoming the odds and and coming out the other side, you know, when logically there's no reason to have hope. And hope really is the the core of the story there of how do they how do they get through whatever scenario. And it's like a personal story because it made me think about, you know, with the story of Abraham and Sarah and this the story that many people are familiar familiar with, with trying to get pregnant, trying to have a baby. It's it's a common motif throughout the Bible of whenever there's an important person born, it always starts with the struggle for their parents to get pregnant in the first place. And it's, you know, it's this whole ethical question that I I think about all the time and I ask my friends about because a lot of my friends have kids and I don't. And I, I think about like the ethical questions of, is it even right to bring a child into this world um, because of the suffering and because of the environmental impact and all these things. And I've had these I've had this conversation with my sister who's had similar concerns to me. She's way more environmentally conscious than me. And she had all these hesitations about whether she wanted to have a, have a child or not as well. And at one point she texted me and said, yep, I decided I do want to have kids. And this was the quote that changed my mind. So this is a quote from Audrey Lord that says, if we can keep this world spinning and remain upon it long enough. The future belongs to us and our children. So from her perspective, she was saying like having a child is this defiant act of hope and choosing hope over despair. I'm pro hope, even though I can (laughs) default to (laughs) the logicalness of despair in, in all kinds of things in this world. Dang. (laughs) That was beautiful. (laughs) Oh, thank you. From the lips of a skeptic, ladies and gentlemen, a reason for hope. I like that. That's good stuff. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any follow-up? I or? have nothing. That, that was so well said. I just, yes, amen. So well said. Amen. Wow. We're, I'm taking you to church today, Jeremy. Buckle up. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Perfect. No no feedback. No notes. I love it. All right. Last, last question then. Verse 20 says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. So I I acknowledge, as you said, this is a little bit of a left turn. Maybe this is a little bit nitpicky. When I was looking for questions and I heard Paul say, Abraham never wavered in his faith, it made me think, wait a minute, wasn't the story of when, when Abraham and Sarah were waiting to get pregnant with Isaac, didn't they kind of waver in their faith because they got impatient and decided to create a child with their, with Sarah's slave, Hagar? which is the origin story of Ishmael. Kind of a long story. There's there's a lot of implications to this, but it made me think of a conversation I had pretty recently with a family member. I was asking him about circumcision in preparation for <laughs> a previous episode. And he brought up something where he said, if Abraham was faithful and he hadn't diverted and had Ishmael with Hagar, then his words, he said, we wouldn't have the Muslim problem we do today. So to criticize the drunk people a little bit, you know, some, some uh some an islamophobic slip perhaps but it, it made me think about uh or maybe kind of research a little bit you know is the origin of islam from ishmael i've kind of heard that i know that's kind of the mythology of where where islam and christianity diverge i would say the bible is not totally clear on it but that does seem to be the common understanding do you think this is a problematic worldview that christians have this view that islam as a religion is a is a product of Abraham's disobedience and a distortion of true faith that we're supposed to have. Wow. It's quite, quite the drunk person quote to use our uh, 
Tolstoy reference from last week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I would say to, to start your, your initial question, yes, Abraham wavered. Like, I don't know how else you would read the story. Uh, he starts, you know, literally, hey, I'll, I'll figure this out on my own because I don't think God's going to get around to this. So here's how mm-hmm. I can make this happen. So I don't know how you'd read it other than that. So I, I land there. As to, you know, is it problematic to view Islam in this way? I don't think it's a problem to disagree with someone. And I hope at a minimum, you and I are modeling that for people. Uh, now, obviously, our disagreements are not gigantic. You know, we, we don't, we're probably more alike in most things than we are different. But we have a variety of disagreements of things that we don't see eye to eye. Obviously, one of them being how we interpret God, you know, how we make sense of, of faith and all this. So I, I don't think that's a problem to say, hey, I do not agree with Islam or I do not agree with a Muslim. And I think if we ever get mm-hmm. to that place where we can't even acknowledge that, then yeah, we're good luck having any conversation with anybody. If, you know, I can't even acknowledge, I don't see it your way. And I disagree with many Christians <laughs> on a lot of things. So I, again, there's not, there's no animosity built into that. It's just an acknowledgement of, yeah, I don't see it the way you see it. Um, and that's okay. And how I, how I engage with you in the disagreement is almost more important to me than the disagreement, right? Do I still look like Jesus to you when I'm disagreeing with you? And this is a check I have just on a personal note, you know, when I get lit up in the comments each week from these very conservative, you know, people, I, I always, you know, I I usually have a, like my first reaction I want to say to them and it's sarcastic and snarky. And that's like, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. And then I'll like ask myself, okay, does that look like Jesus? And usually the answer is no. So I don't say it. I just, you know, just think it to myself, give myself some time. And then if I can write them back without being snarky or, you know, super antagonistic, then I usually try if I can. And sometimes it's like, no, this is, I'm not, I'm not going to get into that one. But that to me is more important. Like I, if I cease to look like Jesus and I become some total a-hole in the way that I am interacting with people online, then that's my issue, not necessarily the people who disagree with me. Now, as to the second part, of, like I, I would say I think it is incredibly offensive <laughs> to say about someone's culture and belief system that it is a product of disobedience. I don't mm-hmm. know how else to... <laughs> I, yeah, right. I, I, I don't know how, I, just on, like, it, it's just, yeah, I would say don't ever, don't ever say to a Muslim that you think what they believe is a product of disobedience. Just for them as a person, like, I, that's not a kind thing to say to anyone. And you wouldn't want anyone saying that about what you believe. Like, oh, the only reason you believe that is because someone messed up and you believe their error. You know what I mean? Like, it's just an incredibly insulting way to frame something. I would also say, it's a poor reading of the text. And so if, you know, if you're a Christian that wants to just bash on Islam as it's a product of the, of Abraham's disobedience, I want to invite you to read the Bible again, because I think you've missed a few things in it. And I'm going to give you two, just two examples that, uh, again, we don't have the time to go into this whole story. And this is obviously a huge question that would warrant m- multiple episodes easily, mm-hmm. but quickly, I would say, here's a couple things. So you have this really profound moment when uh, things start to go wrong with uh, Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah, which is Abraham's wife, is now threatened by her and and is like, look, she's our issue now. She has Ishmael. I don't want her around. And so she sends Hagar and Ishmael away. Basically, go die in the desert. We don't want to have anything to do with us. Here's what Genesis says about that. This is Genesis 16, uh, 7 through 13. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she said. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. So the name Ishmael means God hears. 
For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fists against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Therefore, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, You are the God who sees me. She also said, Have I truly seen the one who sees me? Here's the point. There's one verse in there, verse 12, that people love to cherry pick. He's going to be a wild man, untamed as a donkey. He's going to be in hostility and everyone. And they almost like that's a prescription of like, this is how Islam is going to be. And I've heard Christians use this. That's a prescription to, to, you know, to describe the disobedience or the errant ways. And I would just say, if you read that in context, I think it's more an acknowledgement. It's descriptive rather than prescriptive. It's describing what is going to happen, not saying it has to be this way, but saying this is this is what's going to be because of the way this is all played out. But if you read that story and conclude God doesn't care about Hagar and God doesn't care about Ishmael, you have totally missed God's role in the story. In fact, she's one of the, I think the first one to, to name God in Genesis. Hagar is. You are the God oh. who sees me. And, and this yeah. idea, have I seen the God who sees me? I mean, it's just like beautiful, a beautiful connection. Hagar, the woman out of the marriage, right? The one who didn't belong, who has the son that isn't going to be the son of the promise. And she's told you're going to have all these, you know, descendants and all this. God absolutely is taking care of her, is providing for her, is meeting her in her moment of feeling like I'm, I'm totally overwhelmed. So in addition to, to this the fact, you have to acknowledge God absolutely loved Hagar. God absolutely loved Ishmael. That is very clear in the text. In addition to that, Abraham loved Ishmael. So you, you can't even say, well, yeah, God might have loved him, but like Abraham hated this son. No, he didn't. You keep reading. Get to Genesis 17 verses 18 through 20. So Abraham said to God, May Ishmael live under your special blessing. He, he's like, look, hook him up. Let him have all this. But God replied, no, Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. Again, this is the part Christians focus on, but keep reading. As for Ishmael, I will bless him also, just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. Part of the reason why Ishmael is blessed the way he is, is because Abraham literally asked God to bless Ishmael. So if you read Genesis, you have to conclude God loves Hagar, God loves Ishmael, and Abraham absolutely loved Ishmael. And so to then conclude, this is just this moment of disobedience. Things got out of control. This is all bad. I would just say you're, you're missing what is actually there in the text. And on top of that, I'll end my answer with this, this argument that I, I will absolutely stand by. Almost every Christian I know would benefit immensely from hanging out with more Muslims than they do. Just mic drop right there. That mm -hmm. almost every single person that says they're a Christian, you would benefit from hanging out and actually spending time with a Muslim. When I have traveled the world and I have met Muslims all around the world, I have always been amazed at how kind and generous and thoughtful and nothing like the stereotypes that we often give of them. Now, again, are there bad Muslims? Yes, there's bad everything, right? But mm -hmm. to, to lump any group, uh, usually it comes from you don't actually know a Muslim. You maybe never met a Muslim. And so you have some caricature of them that is easy to villainize. I would say go and meet real Muslims. Get to know them. And you will probably be amazed at what amazing people that they are. I love that. It is it is really interesting. So I I wrote this question to you and then I went back in Genesis and like read through the story a couple of times and tried to make sense of it. It's weird to try to figure out like what, what the dynamics are. It seems clearly that Abraham and, and or Abram and Sarai at the time are, are very 
cruel and abusive to Hagar. One commenter, the commentator I, I was I was looking at pointed out that I mean, Abram, you could say that Abram basically raped Hagar because had sex with her without her consent because she's she's a slave. She didn't have permission in that sense, and basically you know are just like using her in this you know very ancient Near East way of like all that matters is getting into the future. All that matters is having a descendant, just using her as a descendant, and then you know, later changing her mind and just discarding her, banishing her to the desert. Yeah, it, and then it is fascinating that God still blesses Ishmael, but but makes the distinction of you're not under the covenant, but you still have your own blessing and get to form your own nation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know, just fascinating stuff. And then the, the, the other thing that, that's just very strange to think about is uh, later with the story we just talked about of Abraham going to sacrifice Isaac, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him. So that's just a weird thing of like, why is God saying that Isaac is your only son? Because Ishmael is also Abraham's son, right? Well, I think there's a couple ways you can read that. It's the only son legitimately through his marriage. Mm -hmm. Right. So in that culture, Ishmael would not have been considered, you know, the same as Isaac, just like, oh, that's, that was your servant. That wasn't your wife. Right. So you know, there's, there's Sarai had a very elevated status compared to Hagar, you know, in that, in that relationship. Um, but then also, you know, when God has said like the promise is going to be through Isaac, then God's operating on, there's only one person. So which gets back to the point of like Abraham going, okay, well, you're saying this can only be through Isaac. And now you're asking me to kill Isaac. Mm -hmm. Logically, God, this doesn't make any sense unless Abraham believed, all right, you're going to bring Isaac back to life. After I do this, because you have said Isaac's the one that this is going to happen through. And now you're asking me to kill Isaac. So mm, either, okay. you know, so again, it all kind of makes sense if you stick within the narrative of what Abraham's being told. Yeah. I get, for me, I was kind of interpreting it as like maybe because they had banished Hagar and Ishmael, like Abraham and Sarah just considered them dead to them. Like, you're not my son anymore kind of thinking. But again, that was, that was just sort of just the way I was able to make sense of it. I don't but, think Abraham ever felt like mm-hmm. that for Ishmael personally mm-hmm. sort of stacking questions on top of questions here <laughs> but I don't know just I, that really stuck with me when someone when I heard someone say that of like this is the the Muslim problem you know so I, I appreciate you calling out the uh, that and I appreciate your words on that what what's your what's your take on like why does Paul say that Abraham never wavered then like the original question yeah I don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a good question. Well, everything with Hagar and Ishmael is pre the sacrifice well, moment. I was gonna say, so, if, like, if you maybe focus you on wavered. in light of the sacrifice, maybe that's what he's saying. Is like, yeah, the he moment he's pulled to kill Isaac, mm-hmm. he goes he goes through with it. And I guess that's that's an easier way to make sense of that. You know, if he's mm-hmm. if Paul's has that story in mind, right? Which again, like Paul doesn't specifically say that, though James does. James says that you know, it's like. Abraham was doing a good thing by being willing to make the sacrifice, but you know, maybe we can probably talk about that <laughs> a few years from now when we tackle James. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> this Abraham guy, you know, he's, uh, he's really something. He's a lot of stories, that guy. Quite a few. Quite we didn't even cover all of them. Uh, anything else to, to add, Jeremy? You feel good? <laughs> uh, I'll leave it there. I'll uh, say what I said. Thanks for listening, everybody. We appreciate it. Yeah, the word we got through the Abraham chapter. Uh, I promise to try to focus a little bit more on New Testament stuff and less Old Testament stories. Next time in chapter five, there's there's a lot to get to. So uh, we hope you'll stick around. <laughs>